Hi there guys, welcome back to our YouTube channel. I'm Will from Global Geckos, and today I'm gonna to be taking you through one of my favorite families of geckos, and uh, one which I think certainly don't necessarily always get the interest that they deserve here in the UK, mostly because people don't know enough about them or perhaps haven't yet encountered them. So the animals I'm gonna be talking to you about today are the knob-tailed geckos from Australia. Uh, Nephorus is the genus for these guys, and it's roughly split into two groups, so you have the smooth knob-tailed geckos and the rough knob-tailed geckos. And I've got some great examples of both here today to show you. So one of the species which, you're, uh, which you may or may not encounter, um, but certainly one of the more commonly kept species, are Nephorus levis, the smooth knob-tailed gecko. And this is an adult male, so you can see they're not a very large species at all. Um, I mean, you know, we're probably looking at just over 10 centimetres, maybe, uh, maybe sort of uh, 10 to 12 centimetres here, or 3 to 4 inches. And they are kind of disproportionately top heavy, in so much as they have that really large head with big eyes. And their tail, uh, sort of typical of, the, uh, typical of the whole family, is quite short and ends in this small sort of like little Almost like, a, almost like a bobble, but as, uh, as they tend to say, a knob tail. Uh, so that is Nephorus levis. Then we also have, staying with the smooth knob tails, the next one that we have to show you is Nephorus vertebralis, or the midline knob tail gecko. So very similar in general appearance, but as you can see from the markings, so these guys, they have this wonderful white stripe running down their, running down their back. And they take on, um, generally speaking, almost a little bit lighter markings along their flanks as well. And they're actually a slightly smaller species again. So this here is kind of a sub-adult female. They get fractionally larger than this, but not really. And they're definitely a slightly finer build than the Nephorus levis. Um, this is a species that you pretty much will never see here in the UK. Um, to the best of my knowledge, we're currently the only people breeding these. Um, there may be other breeders dependent upon when you watch this video, but certainly at this point in time, nobody else is, uh, nobody else is keeping and breeding this species here in, uh, here in the UK. They're another one which we, uh, which we really like. Then moving from the smooth knobtails over to the rough knobtails, Next up we have, so we have Nephorus cinctus. So the first thing to immediately point out is, although the general body shape is almost identical, the scalation here, these guys are really quite, I mean, rough is almost an understatement. It's kind of prickly, their general, uh, their general sort of uh, scalation here. But again, these are quite a small species here. So these are, uh, these are a banded uh, 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 knobtail species. So you can see from a couple of bands here. There used to be two subspecies, uh, Nephorus wheelowi and Nephorus wheelowi cinctus. They're now separate species. And the majority of the ones which you see are Nephorus cinctus, the same as this. Um, so again, these are, they're probably the most commonly encountered of the knobtail geckos now, but they're a small rough knobtail gecko. And then finally, that brings us on to the Centralian knobtail gecko, which is the largest of all of the species in the family. It's another rough knobtail, and it's probably, for many people, regarded not just as the holy grail of knobtail geckos, but certainly as one of the holy grail species of gecko keeping full stop. And you can see they have this almost uh, almost comical sized tail. So this is an adult female here, and you can see her tail is absolutely tiny. That's not a regen tail, that is her full size natural tail there. But you can see really, really top heavy this species. So massive head at the front there. And that's actually uh, partially due to their wild diet as well as eating insects. Um, certainly these, uh, certainly Nephorus amii here, they can be cannibalistic uh, when it comes to other gecko species. So certainly some of the smaller Australian gecko species often will fall prey to these guys. So that big head and powerful jaws are there um, mostly to help them when hunting really. From a lifespan viewpoint, any of the knobtails, any of the nephorus are gonna live certainly a good 10 plus years, but I would like to think that most of them will exceed 15 years. As a kind of honorable mention at the end here as well, we also have a species which 
dependent upon the literature that you read, may or may not be classed as a knob-tailed gecko for, I think it was between about 2005 and 2010, they were classed as a nephorus, but to most people they're actually in a different genus uh, called Underwoodisaurus. This is Underwoodisaurus milli, or the Australian barking gecko, and these are, um, these are slightly different in terms of their general appearance, so you can see that the tail is considerably longer on these guys, but aside from that, the general body plan is kind of the same and the care is almost identical across the whole family. Um, these, if anything, are more similar to the smooth knobtails rather than to the rough knobtails. Um, but when it comes to their care, there is a couple of minor differences between these guys and the rest of the knobtails. But for the purpose of this video, I'm going to include these Australian barking geckos in with the rest of them because they are all very similar. The general natural habitat of any of the Australian knobtail geckos does vary a little bit from species to species, but on the whole it would be, uh, it would be a safe bet to say that they're generally from quite an arid kind of environment. You would find them sheltering in amongst rocks and certainly for some of the species in amongst things like termite hills and things like that. They would seek their general sort of like daytime refuge away from the heat of the Australian sun. So that is their natural habitat, but when it comes to their captive environment, you can keep them in uh, glass enclosures, but my honest opinion is that the kind of the glass fronted melamine style enclosures are gonna be a better bet simply because they're a little bit easier to heat to the sort of temperatures that you're looking for for keeping any of these, uh, any of these nephros, these knob-tailed geckos. The general size is a bare minimum of a two foot enclosure, so 60 centimeters by sort of like 45 deep. That will work well for some of the smaller species. Perhaps for things like the Centralian, so the Nephorus amii, you may certainly wish to go a little bit bigger than that, perhaps to a 90 centimeter enclosure by sort of 45 by 45, just to give them a little bit more space in their environment. As far as sort of like heating and lighting for their enclosures goes, in a smaller enclosure you could use a heat mat running through a thermostat, but certainly for a, any form of a larger enclosure, we tend to actually prefer to heat them from above during the day and then to give them a really good day-night cycle so that they're getting the heat during the day and then we actually we turn their heating off overnight. We find that this helps to replicate the kind of environment which they would naturally be from. So in order to do this, we tend to use a light fitting attached to the underside of the vivarium, uh, sort of um, the vivarium lid and then we will use something like a low wattage halogen in order to provide a very focused basking area for them. Uh, again we will control that through a dimming thermostat or if you wish to have something a little bit more advanced then there is the option of things like the microclimate Evo range where these can be controlled from a smartphone. So we tend to use an overhead heat source on during the day off at night simply because in a uh, in quite an exposed environment, which is where they would naturally be found, there's a massive swing between daytime highs and nighttime lows. You're aiming for an ambient sort of temperature of about 28 to 30 during the day, with a hot spot of about 32 to 34. And then overnight, they can actually take temperatures, certainly for some species, as low as about 10 or 12 degrees overnight. And one other thing to point out, rather than keep them at a constant temperature year round, we will always bromate them, which is kind of a period of lowered temperature over the winter. We find that this helps especially with the benefit of stimulating them to breed for the following spring. When it comes to providing your uh, Australian knobtail geckos with an appropriate environment in captivity, one of the best things that you can go for as a bedding material is something to replicate the kind of sandy soils that they would live on naturally in the wild. So ones which we like, we like the BioLife Desert, so this is like a sandy loam, this one. And another one which we find that works particularly well is actually the, uh, the Leo Life. So this one is sort of a sandy clay kind of based soil. This one, this one also works really well for them. So we'll use that as a general bedding material. 
then aside from that, you're gonna to wanna to provide them with a few hiding areas. So we will always make sure that we use some form of heavy resin based hide immediately below their heat source. So this will then give them a warm environment that they can also seek shelter in. So this is kind of like their, their hot hide within their environment. And then down towards the cool end, we will often provide them with another hiding area Quite often this may be one which has a base to it which we will then put either some dampened coir or moss into just to provide them with a humid hide. It is worth noting however that most rough knobtails will not use a humid hide, most smooth knobtails will and when it comes to the Australian barking gecko, so the Underwoody Saurus Millie, uh, one which used to be Nephrus Millie for a short time, that I would definitely say requires the humid hide and they will often seek that out and spend considerable amounts of time in there. So dependent upon species, the addition of a humid hide is variable, but it's certainly something to bear in mind. Other cage furnishings will often also provide sort of cork flats, so lower lying bits which they can then just dig under to provide them with a little bit of security and then also we'll often use sort of various bits of natural rocks and slate within their environment as well. If you wish you can put live plants in their enclosure but you are going to need to put ones which are going to be tolerant of quite a hot arid environment so we tend to use things like aloes and San Severas, simply because these kind of plants are gonna to be tough enough to stand up to the kind of environmental conditions within the, env within the uh, environment for your knob-tailed gecko. From a dietary perspective, with any of your Australian knob-tailed geckos, they are all insectivorous, as I said earlier on in the video, some species like the Nephrus amii, the Centralian knobtail, they would also eat smaller lizards naturally in the wild, but certainly in captivity we tend to feed them just on insects. So large crickets or locusts tend to form the staple diet for them, but it is worth noting that they will also take things like, um, things like the wax worms, which are small caterpillars, and then mealworms as well. One thing that I would say though is, as with any gecko, feeding of worms is more of a treat rather than a staple just due to the high fat content. Again, as with all reptiles, we do need to provide them with an additional calcium supplement. So we tend to use the Arcadia Earth Pro A when that is paired with a good UV light. So we always provide them with the Arcadia Shade Dweller within their environment. This is on during the day and off at night. That combination of UVB and a non-D3 containing supplement we find works really well for us and it's definitely what we would recommend for their care. One thing is though, from time to time, especially with egg laying females, you may wish to provide them with additional dietary D3. So you can do that using something like the Arcadia Revitalized D3. We tend to use this about once per fortnight as standard. And then for egg laying females, we'll probably use it once per week. One of the last bits to discuss with any of the nephros is the fact that they are actually a very handleable uh, group of geckos. So people often think of leopard geckos and perhaps fat tail geckos as being the only sort of beginner species of gecko to start with. But actually any of these Australian nephorus are kind of like, uh, they're sort of Australia's answer to the leopard gecko in so much as they are a small, compact, relatively hardy and straightforward to care for uh, group of species. And well, as you can see, they're all very, very tolerant of handling pretty much irrespective of species. So I would definitely say for a dedicated beginner that perhaps wants something a little bit more unusual, or even if you're just looking for something a little bit smaller than a leopard gecko where keeping them in sort of a 60 centimeter enclosure is a little bit more of a, uh, more of a realistic size for them, certainly for some of the smooth knob tails, um, that's gonna be an appropriate size enclosure, whereas especially for things like the leopard geckos these days, we would always like to see them kept in at least a 90 centimeter enclosure. So if you perhaps haven't got the space for a leopard gecko, but you would like something just as easy to look after, that's also gonna be equally handleable, definitely, definitely would recommend uh, exploring further the prospect of keeping uh, one of the Australian knobtail geckos. These are charming and fascinating animals to keep.